A message of defiance from Italian voters as the ruling Democratic Party crumbles at the ballot box. We ask what's behind the country's staggering surge in right-wing populism. I'm Imran Gatta, and today's newsmaker is the Italian election. A polarized Italy went to the polls on Sunday, cementing a division that seemed years in the making. With no party winning a majority, Italy is set to enter an era of political uncertainty where far-right groups will hold considerable sway. A large portion of voters cast their ballots for once fringe movements whose anti-immigrant platforms have previously had little success. One of the leaders to emerge is the anti-establishment five-star movement, whose 31-year-old leader Luigi Di Maio credited social media for his party's rise. Another big winner was the centre-right coalition, cobbled together with the help of former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. We sent Sandra Gatman to one Italian town on the outskirts of Rome to shed light on what's behind this wave of populism. Italy woke up to a political deadlock after one of the most divisive and unpredictable elections in years. Millions of people voted for change against traditional parties making way for the new. But Italy's power shift began last year in small towns across the country. Formello is a community of just 13,000, but it's one of Italy's 10 wealthiest towns with a rich history. It's the final stop on the ancient pilgrimage route, the Via Francigena. From the top of this tower, the pilgrims uh, uh, can see for the first time uh, the goal, the goal of the pilgrimage. But recently, Formello has undergone a sudden change. Last year's June elections marked a political turning point here in Formello. After 25 years, the Democrats were voted out and a coalition of new parties, including far-right ones, were voted in. As one of its first acts, the new local council closed down the Pilgrims' Hostel. When Sergio was mayor, he had promoted tourism and wanted to integrate the Roman residents the locals see as foreigners. When you ask people, they just said, uh, OK, now you've been ruling for 25 years. Now, now let's change. The majority of the inhabitants come from Rome. And, and there's a mix between uh, people who who born here, who have always been living here, and who feel themselves the owners of, of the memory and of the tradition, and other people who came from 30 to uh, years ago to to two months ago. Uh, since June, one of the claims of the new administration was let's retake back our city. Ciao. So that guy has been saying something funny. What did he say? Because uh, he said, wasn't it better when you were here? Right. Oh, the old fascist. Because there's also a, a, a saying, it's, it's, uh, it's a joke, no? Mm. Uh, Right-winged people are fascist and left people <laughs> are communists. Yeah. Of course, it's not like that. But it's, it's an example on how, in Italy, things get extreme. The far-right party La Lega is now a dominant political force in Formello and growing in popularity across Italy. Sta prendendo molto piede la Lega perché c'è un malcontento della popolazione in merito alla cattiva gestione politica degli ultimi anni. Sicuramente un perno è l'esodo non controllato di tutti questi clandestini dove non è ben gestito e che ha portato malcontento alla popolazione. Voters like Sandro have been won over by the League's drive to control immigration. In uh, 
10 anni, 7 furti. Il La, lavoro che comunque sia parecchi lavorano in nero, extramilitari lavorano in nero e ti portano via quel poco, però quel poco che ti aiuta l'azienda a campare, a tirare avanti. But not everyone in Formello thinks immigration itself is the problem. Sono figlio di un marocchino che è venuto 30 anni fa qua in Italia a lavorare, ha sempre lavorato. Qua il problema dell'Italia non è l'immigrazione in sé per sé, il problema dell'Italia è non controllare, ecco. Non c'è un, diciamo, un controllo vero e proprio per chi entra, quindi possono entrare tutti. L'Italia poi diciamo che non ha questa possibilità di dar lavoro a tutti. Omar supports the Five Star Movement. He says Italy's other parties have done little to help the economy. La ecco, io ho famiglia, una figlia, lavoro, però diciamo la direzione è quella, non, non si va dalla parte giusta né per i giovani né per gli anziani, non c'è un fondo pensionistico vero e proprio, rischio che non, vado, non andrò mai in pensione. Frustration and dissolution explains how Italy got here. A depressed economy and immigration were seen as the biggest threats to Italy's way of life. Whatever shape the next government takes, Italy's new leaders are faced with a colossal task to deliver the change the country has longed for. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers, Rome. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined from the Italian town of Urbino by Fabio Bordignon. He was an observer of the Italian elections. In Rome, we have Raffaele Marchetti. He's a senior assistant professor of international relations at Luis Guido Carli University. And completing our panel, also in Rome, is journalist Maurizio Caprara. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Maurizio Caprara, if I can begin with you, populism seems to be alive and well in Italy after this election. Tell me why do you think Italians have chosen this path? Italians have chosen this path because uh, for 10 years uh, Italy had a low uh, an economic crisis and then uh, a low uh, growth rate and uh, uh, also if the economy is going better the perception of the people is that these years are not being good and uh, uh, there is also an alarm on my personal point of view an alarm which is exaggerate on uh, uh, migrations and uh, these alarm uh, are has been used by the populist forces to work on the feelings uh, the deep feelings of fear uh, connected with the economic crisis that is the main reason then there is also uh, um, difficulties for uh, the classical center left uh, forces and also for the side of the center right led by Silvio Berlusconi to gain consensus and is like uh, um, a huge amount of people is saying uh, get away we, we don't want to have uh, something to do with you uh, and uh, it's um, maybe it's a particular right. season but he will have after months also on the European Union right so Fabio the biggest winners seem to be the sort of right-wing coalition plus the five-star movement. What was behind their magic? Did they have to work very hard for these votes or was the context just perfect for them this time around? I would say that the context was uh, perfect because uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, a government uh, that is not uh, a result of, uh, uh, of elections like uh, the, the, the government that Italy uh, has had in the last uh, uh, seven seven years uh, I think uh, uh, there is the perfect scenario for the uh, rise of the populist forces consider that uh, if we uh, sum together the uh, votes that uh, uh, the league and the five star movement uh, have got yesterday we arrive at uh, 50 50 percent so uh, there is a, a large uh, disappointment in the country about uh, how Italy has been led uh, in the recent phase and uh, this uh, uh, creates uh, the perfect scenario for uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of parties. And Fabio, are you worried? 
No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, worried, but uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, looking ahead, uh, seeing a very uh, uncertain future because uh, uh, there is not a majority, and it will not uh, be easy to to build one uh, inside this uh, uh, this parliament. Uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, the result of this new electoral uh, law, which is mainly uh, proportional, with a little correction. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, which regards the uh, the first past the post uh, uh, seats, and uh, uh, it's very it will be very complicated in the next uh, weeks uh, or maybe months. Rafael Marchetti, is it possible to take these results, look at it objectively, and think, okay, it's possible to build a functioning, good, governing coalition with the Five Star Movement and? the right-wing coalition, or even including the centre-left in, in some way, is it going to be easy and possible? Uh, it's not going to be easy. It is possible. I um, mean, we have seen very different kinds of coalitions in history, so it is possible. Of course, uh, there will be a few weeks of very intense negotiations. Uh, there are different options. We still need to see the, the very final results with the clear distribution of seats. And from there, there will be uh, open negotiations. There are two options at the moment, uh, a center-right uh, uh, government with few other uh, MPs, from, maybe from the center-left, uh, or an, a five-star movement government with some uh, backing again from the center-left um, uh, sides of the political right. spectrum. So in a way, um, the center uh, left has lost the elections clearly, uh, but still has a, a margin of uh, maneuvering uh, it, because it, it can sort of choose whether to back a center uh, right uh, coalition or the five star movement co uh, government. Yeah. And, and Maurizio, one man who has re emerged yet again. Silvio Berlusconi, don't rule him out. The man is, what, in his 80s now? But for some reason, he keeps on re-emerging. He's back again in the political sphere. Tell me why Italians like him so much. Uh, they like him less than before. Uh, and they liked him uh, a lot at the beginning because uh, Mr. Berlusconi gave a double message. One, it was, if you are with me, you will be one of the people that renew this country, will change it. And at the same time, uh, an underlying message uh, was uh, um, no problem. If you have problem with taxes, if you have problem building homes and you were not allowed, uh, I won't be uh, so stricter that you will have uh, some troubles. And this double message was uh, uh, effective for a long time. Then now Silvio Berlusconi has not the capability to stop the increase of a rightist right. Uh, Silvio Berlusconi, in, in his way, he has been a moderate. Uh, and uh, moderate are not the winners of these elections. Yeah, and one of the ways in which they disseminated their information seems to be on social media. Rafael Marquet Marchetti, we have a quote from Matteo Salvini saying, thank God for the internet, thank God for social media. Thank God for Facebook. Help us understand how the message, whatever that message might be, whether it was anti-immigrant or just essentially against the system, help us understand how that filtered through the society, especially through non-traditional ways. Well, it's clear that the winners are also the best users of the social media. Uh, both the Five Star Movements and the League, uh, Northern League, are those who are best at, better at sort of playing the game of the social media. Um, the Five Star Movement, in a way, uh, declares its own nature based on, on internet, this kind of e-participation. Uh, Northern League is very effective on social media. Um, there are also, from time to time, rumors uh, about sort of a kind of a fake news circulating, mm -hmm. though the, in this case, Probably they were not uh, so important, but clearly, I mean, this was uh, this is a, a commonality between the winners, uh, the good use of social media, much more than, of course, uh, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, who was uh, 
uh, much better of using TVs rather than social media, right. or the PD not really effective on that side. Yeah, and it's interesting watching footage of him as well. He still seems to sort of flash the smile for the photo op and talk to the old lady and so on. A very old style of doing things, it still seems to work for him. Uh, Fabio, for those who see that the right wing, especially the far right, has a voice and will have a, a voice after these elections, they look at Italy from the outside and they think, oh my God, far right, what is this going to be? Mussolini again. Help, help me understand the, the tone and the atmosphere regarding them and what they want. Well, surely uh, the, the balance inside the, the center-right coalition has shifted towards the, the right, uh, and uh, I would say uh, towards the, the extreme right, uh, because the, the League, uh, once a regionalist uh, party, has now been transformed by uh, its leader, Matteo Salvini, into uh, a nationalist Eurosceptic party, which uh, takes uh, the French Front National as a, as a model. And uh, consider that uh, among its voters, about 69% see foreign people as a danger, uh, while the mean uh, in Italian society is about uh, 45. So uh, we have uh, at the same time uh, uh, Brothers of Italy, Giorgia Meloni's party inside the center right coalition, which is uh, uh, the heir of the post fascist movement in, uh, in Italy. And uh, at the same time, there are many far right uh, movements and parties outside the official center right, uh, which are very active in Italy and have increased their activism uh, and public visibility in recent days. Right. And I'm glad that Fabio mentioned Euroscepticism mm -hmm. because I want to ask you, Rafael Marchetti, mm -hmm. should they be concerned in Brussels? Well, yes, I think so. And they were concerned before the election, during the election campaigns. There were uh, repeated messages coming from Brussels of uh, worry. Um, both uh, the League, the Northern League, and uh, the Five Star Movements are not definitely not Euro enthusiastic. Uh, they belong to a different camp, a camp that is very critical of the European institution, the European project, of course, uh, the League much more than the Five Star Movements, but both are critical. So it's very clear that uh, if they go and they manage to create a government, their, their, then their attitude toward the, the European uh, Union institutions uh, will be troublesome, will be, uh, I mean, critical. They will engage in harsh negotiations. Both um, mention in their campaign that their intention of renegotiating a number of uh, uh, agreements um, Salvini himself continues to repeat that the euro is a currency that is bound to uh, die, to, to, to be sort of cancelled. Until a few months ago, the Five Star Movement uh, uh, was in favour of a referendum, calling for a referendum for opting out of the euro. Just recently, they have changed a bit their position, uh, but clearly uh, they are not in the same camp with Macron and Merkel. Right. And this will be a, a, an issue in European politics and will probably uh, cause a certain degree of marginalization of Italy from the central uh, Franco-German uh, um, relation. Right. Marginalization doesn't necessarily mean leaving Europe, but maybe the relationship won't be... So great anymore, Maurizio, when we look at that, if we have a coalition between the Five Star Movement and the League, would being in power mean that they temper their, their big talk of being anti-EU, or will we actually see the process of Italy starting to extricate itself from the European Union? No, I don't think Italy can go out from the European Union, and I think that also the winners of the election have to face the reality. Without Euro, Italians would be more poor than they are now, of course, because the power of, the, of that uh, currency is higher than any kind of going back to the lira. And so the retirement wages and uh, all the amounts of money that Italians have uh, would uh, have a, a less value than, than now. So I think they uh, can't uh, bring Italy out of Euro uh, if something else doesn't happen in, in the currency. 
And uh, uh, I think that Italy won't be in the front line of a European uh, effort to re-enhance the European Union. And it will be not close to French and Germany in the uh, kind of, uh, we can call, uh, uh, a liaison or alliance they are doing mm -hmm. for announce the European Union again. Uh, may I spend a few words in defense of the TV influence? Go ahead. Um, you were talking about the internet, and I think that uh, Matteo Salvini and his league uh, has been held more than internet from the TV programs. Uh, they were uh, a destroyed political party in 2013 after scandals and after a lack of voters. And uh, then the presence of Matteo Salvini in a lot of TV programs helped him changing also uh, the political strategy of his party uh, uh, to gain more consensus. Okay, well, so then he's wrong. He should have added, thank God for TV as well. Fabio Bordignon, free and fair election. Elections, in a way, give us the pulse of, of a nation. For those on the outside who see where the Italians have voted, what they have chosen, if you could sum up what do Italians want after this election, what would that be? I would say that uh, this uh, uh, result uh, on the one side uh, show how uh, Italy is, is still uh, uh, affected by a strong political and economic uh, malaise. And uh, this election is also the demonstration that uh, that malaise cannot be cured only uh, building defensive uh, barriers against uh, populism, uh, trying to uh, keep uh, uh, the populist monster uh, outside the, the political palace. Uh, but I think that uh, traditional parties, if they want to, to survive, they need to uh, start imagining a, a new political vision for, uh, for the future. And, uh, uh, of course, the Five Star Movement and uh, the League are populist party, but uh, they uh, have been able, especially the Five Star Movement, to uh, express not only a protest uh, vote, but uh, uh, provide an alternative, uh, a real alternative to Italian voters. Right. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure learning about the Italian political system and where you're headed. I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Unfortunately, I've got to move on. Maurizio Caprara, Raffaele Marchetti, and Fabio Bordignon. Thanks again. Still ahead on the Newsmakers, Lebanon's Prime Minister Saad Hariri returns to Riyadh just months after his bizarre TV resignation. What was different this time around? and a killing that sent shockwaves across Slovakia. We look at how a journalist's murder has blown the lid off corruption. The world was stunned late last year when Saad Hariri abruptly stepped down as Lebanon's prime minister live on TV while in a visit to Saudi Arabia's capital. But that resignation was short-lived as Hariri reneged once he got back to Beirut. This past week, Hariri went back to Riyadh, this time smiling and posing with the country's leaders in a selfie. So what's behind this about-face? Have the differences between the Saudis and Hariri really been smoothed over? Shoaib Hassan has more. A sign of how quickly the tide can turn in Middle Eastern politics. Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri smiling alongside Saudi Arabia's US ambassador and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. In a selfie he snapped during his latest official trip to Riyadh. It all went very amicably, in contrast to his previous visit. That ended with this shock announcement. <laughs> Hariri seemed pressured by Crown Prince Mohammed to step down, but he said his decision was due to the growing influence of Iran in his country. Tehran's main proxy, Hezbollah, remains a powerful political force in Lebanon. It's all part of a regional rivalry between the House of Saud and Iran's powerful clerics. But within days of returning to Lebanon, Hariri retracted his resignation as part of an apparent deal with Hezbollah. <laughs> التزام الحكومة اللبنانية 
بكل مكوناتها السياسية النائي بنفسها عن أي نزاعات أو صراعات أو حروب وعن شؤون الداخلية للدول العربية It's a deal that may or may not hold given the fragile nature of similar arrangements in the past as evident with Hariri's father, former PM Rafiq Hariri his switching of alliances named as a key factor in his assassination in 2005. The act was blamed on Syria and Hezbollah. So has Hariri done enough to satisfy Riyadh, or is he continuing to play both sides of the fence? Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Beirut is Jamal Hossen. He's the former managing editor at Al Akhbar newspaper. Also in Beirut, political analyst Halim Shebaya. And in Riyadh, we have Salman Al Ansari. He's the founder and president of the Saudi American Public Relation Affairs Committee. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Jamal, let me begin with you. What's going on with Saad Hariri? Why was he back in Saudi Arabia? Well, that's a very open-ended question. There are many issues uh, still pending from his last visit to Saudi Arabia. And of course, uh, uh, we might have some answers in the coming days uh, as we see the results of this uh, latest visit. Uh, but uh, there were definitely uh, a lot of loose ends, a lot of question marks, and uh, with the elections, parliamentary elections coming up in Lebanon, uh, the Saudi camp in Lebanon uh, had to uh, tighten these loose ends, and uh, this visit, this recent visit to Saudi Arabia, uh, has to be seen in that light. Okay, so Salman, tightening loose ends, do you agree with that? And if you do, what are those loose ends? Uh, basically, when it comes to Saudi-Lebanese relationship, we should always mention the historical context as well, so we can understand the depth of the relationship. Uh, when it comes to Riyadh-Beirut relationship, we are actually having uh, this uh, model of relationship between two countries where Saudi Arabia has been uh, helping Lebanon with more than $70 billion just for the last 15 years. So, and it's actually very interesting because uh, the amount of aid that has been provided by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to Lebanon is bigger than the investment of Saudi Arabia in Lebanon itself. So that means that Saudi is very keen to uh, have Lebanon to be uh, safe, to be independent, to not be uh, part of any uh, um, uh, game of specifically the radical uh, Iranian regime. So I think uh, this visit of Saudi Hariri has rectified um, uh, the trajectory in the relationship and it showed to the people that all the misconceptions and misinformation about his uh, previous visit was absolutely wrong. Okay. Saman, let me ask you, for those who would think, is the price you pay for the $70 billion that the Saudis can call you at any time or recall you at any time and make you humiliate yourself and resign live on TV? I think this is. Um, I think this was uh, the biggest uh, joke uh, of the last uh, couple of months about the idea of having a president, a prime minister of a different of a different country, to come to a different country and resign. So uh, I think it's it's uh, completely nonsense. It had no proofs, and he himself uh, denied it completely. And he himself called the people who talked about this as, as basically liars. So I think this uh, propaganda has been initiated by the militant despicable group of Hezbollah, which is uh, recognized internationally as a terrorist group, and all their media engines were fabricating the news about this. But I think uh, the Saudi uh, people and the Saudi leadership and the Lebanese people and the Lebanese uh, leadership are aware that such information is completely fabricated and we should not even look at it. Okay, before I bring you in, Halim, my apologies. Jamal, I saw you had a little smirk when uh, Salman mentioned what he, what he called the despicable group Hezbollah. Tell me why. Oh, uh, no, I think uh, the smirk uh, refers to everything, pretty much everything that Mr. Salman uh, is saying in uh, Riyadh. Uh, he mentioned uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, he, he uh, is calling all the reports that came out of uh, Saudi Arabia during the detention of uh, Saad al-Hariri in his last visit as propaganda. Uh, I think he would be well advised to read a lot of uh, coverage that came out uh, if, if he doesn't like to read Lebanese news. Actually, he cannot read Al-Akhbar because it is blocked in 
in Saudi Arabia, but you can read the New York Times where they uh, spoke about uh, the details of uh, how uh, Saad al-Hariri was manhandled and possibly more. Uh, he, he called it, uh, he said it was bad and that he doesn't want to talk about it. We're talking about the prime minister of a sovereign country who was uh, kept out of, uh, uh, disconnected uh, with the outside world, he, he was not allowed to talk to his uh, advisors, he was not allowed to, and he was forced to resign. Something that he did, he went back on the very the moment he came back to Beirut. And you saw a person in Beirut who was acting completely free, who uh, was meeting with people because they were uh, trying to, one of the reasons that uh, he, uh, he stated in the resignation letter that was written by the Saudis for him, uh, was that he's, uh, he was threatened, that yet we saw him uh, mingling with the people on the streets. Uh, and if we look at what happened in Saudi Arabia afterwards, we saw that uh, the person who was in charge of the Lebanese uh, file in Saudi Arabia, Thamir al-Saban, was uh, basically uh, sidelined, and we right. uh, never heard from him anymore after he was uh, commenting daily on, uh, on Lebanese news. So I would advise Mr. Salman to basically read up uh, a few things uh, from his um, American uh, media, if he wants, if he doesn't want to read, read Lebanese media, which covers the uh, whole affair very extensively. And it's very clear what happened in the last visit, not just with uh, Saad al-Hariri, with other people who were held at the Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh. Right. OK. And Salman, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. But first, let me bring Bring in Halim. Halim, as we go back to the beginning here, Saad Hariri, going back to Riyadh, tell me what you think were his intentions in going to Riyadh and what sort of message did he want to give to the Lebanese people and to the outside world? I mean, the message that uh, Mr. Hariri gave to the Lebanese people yesterday uh, when he commented, uh, he was commenting very briefly, he didn't speak much about what happened during his visit, uh, just like he didn't speak much about what happened during his November visit. Uh, he said that he wanted to show a clear message that Saudi Arabia is supporting him personally, because there's been a lot of uh, uh, debate about whether Saudi Arabia is no longer uh, supporting him. Of course, we still, as Jamal uh, mentioned, we still need to see uh, what this means in practice. Uh, I'll also comment about the exchange that took place uh, just a, a few minutes ago Go between ahead. the two uh, guests in that um, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't an issue of propaganda because we have the president of the republic president Michel Aoun who actually said that uh, Mr. Hariri was uh, detained in Riyadh and uh, Mr. Hariri came back and he never took issue with the president himself and I think this is one issue and this is perhaps why there wasn't a joint conference in Riyadh this time around is perhaps maybe to avoid answering these tough questions uh, from all you know, all journalists throughout the world who really were uh, dubbing it as one of the most uh, mysterious and curious cases ever seen between the history of uh, relations between states. But I would mention one thing, that in terms of, yes, indeed, uh, it was a very controversial re resignation. He came back from it. But the issue and the main uh, problem for uh, Saudi Arabia, which was mentioned by Mr. Uh, from your guest in, uh, in Riyadh, that uh, is really the question of Hezbollah. And it will come back, it will remain. And the question going forward will always be, what does Saudi Arabia want from Mr. Hariri in exchange for its support when it comes to Hezbollah? Will it allow uh, uh, Mr. Saad al-Hariri to form a new government after the elections, supposing that he's going to be the one who's going to be asked by the uh, president to form a new government? Will it accept that he form a new government with Hezbollah? Uh, will there be uh, increased tensions after the elections, since now it's right. pointless in these two months to have any discussion about Hezbollah. But uh, I think in general, uh, it could, I could describe it as a win-win situation for both Mr. Hariri and for uh, Saudi Arabia and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, in that Hariri uh, benefits from being seen once again as close to Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia benefits from kind of trying to close the door on that, uh, you know, uh, very uh, strange occurrence that took place in November when Mr. Hariri was, at the very least, he was pressured to uh, resign. We don't know exactly whether he was detained, right. whether he was under house arrest, whether he was under anything, any other situation. But I think it sort of closes the, the door on that chapter. And perhaps also there was a personal element to this visit in terms of, I thought from my own observations of seeing Mr. Hariri yesterday speak, that he was uh, more relaxed, much more relaxed than when he came back uh, last time. It seems that maybe, you know, as we say in Arabic, uh, like cleansing of hearts in terms of, you know, uh, talking about what happened maybe. And as we... As as Jamal also mentioned, right. uh, Mr. Hold Hariri up. mentioned that what happened in Riyadh in right. November 2017 is a black box. He will not mention it. Okay. And he I would just ask it. the he... guest in uh, Riyadh right. if, it was, if it was just business as usual. Okay, yeah, go ahead. fair enough. You, you posed a bunch of questions to Salman. One of the more interesting ones, I think, 
I'd like you to address, Salman, is this idea that, and, and given that you understand the thinking behind Saudi foreign policy better than most of us, would Saudi accept Saad Hariri including Hezbollah in any governing coalition for the sake of his country? It's a sovereign country. I know you find Hezbollah despicable. I know you see them as puppets of Iran and so, so on and so forth. But they're a part of the society. They're in the government. Would Saudi Arabia ever accept Saad Hariri including them at the table? Great question. But let me just highlight or just um, touch base on the things that your guest uh, mentioned with regard to looking at the media and what the reports say. What about looking at the person in charge, Saad Hariri himself? If he said such news are coming from liars, what should we say? Should we go and say, let's look at the New York Times or the Akhbar, as he said? So I think we should not spend some time on such information that are completely baseless, but the only thing that they had, which was just a propaganda kind of campaign that was managed by the militant uh, group of, of, of Hezbollah. This is number one. To answer your question, I, as I always say, we always have to go back to the historical context between uh, in, uh, for the relationship between Saudi Arabia and uh, Lebanon. And there are two years that every Lebanese cannot forget, 1989 and 2006. In 1989, Saudi Arabia managed solely to completely stop the war, the civil war in, 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 in Lebanon, which was under the Taif uh, Agreement, Taif Deal. Uh, this is number one. Number two, in 2006, Saudi Arabia was the biggest donor of uh, uh, the rebuilding of Lebanon. So the Lebanese people know for a fact how Saudi Arabia is completely concerned about uh, their stability. And let's not forget the fact that there are 250,000 Lebanese living here in Saudi Arabia, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where there are 1,200 Lebanese only in, in Iran, the country that is supporting uh, Hezbollah, and Hassan Nasrallah himself admits it. So. To answer your question, I know for a fact that Saudi Arabia is pragmatic. Saudi Arabia does not want to, to inflame uh, um, uh, the political uh, kind of uh, um, uh, fabric in Lebanon. Uh, Saudi Arabia is aware of the Iranian uh, 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 militant kind of tactics within uh, Lebanon. So, but this should not be, the pragmatism of Saudi Arabia should not be uh, something to say so Saudi Arabia would be stopping uh, its confrontation with all the non-state actors in the region because Hezbollah is training Houthis in Yemen. Sure. Hezbollah but is someone, sending ballistic elsewhere missile technology they might to different be, Elsewhere uh, they might be a non-state actor. In Lebanon, they're, a, they're part of the state. And there's a difference, isn't there? Or does Saudi just treat them like a rebel even, group within even, Lebanon? Okay, even, even if it's not Hezbollah itself, if the government of Lebanon itself, let's assume that it's actually supporting non-state actors in different parts of the Arab world, like in Yemen, Saudi Arabia will put the, the, the Lebanese uh, government accountable. But what we, are seeing, what we are seeing in Lebanon is that there are two governments. It's not a one unified government, and everyone knows that. And the Lebanese people, even the people from uh, the southern parts of Lebanon, know for a fact that there are two governments, one that is completely allied to Iran, and one that is just uh, neutral and that wants to, to build up the country, which is uh, basically uh, uh, the government of uh, Prime okay. Minister uh, Saad al-Hariri. Okay. So it's very important for right. the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the international community to support the unification of Lebanon and the unification of its policies, instead of just supporting Lebanon in such a way that would allow them to help the Hezbollah militia to go ahead and support other non-state actors okay, let me in get, the region. Let me get a this response is not from, acceptable okay. and it will never be acceptable. Okay, the long and the short of it, Jamal, from Salman, is that Saudi Arabia has good intentions when it comes to Lebanon. Do you believe that? Well, uh, I mean, he keeps uh, bringing up uh, the money that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, gives to Lebanon. And uh, yet, at the same point, he himself mentioned that they want to confront uh, the uh, Hezbollah in, by name and other uh, non-state actors that he called uh, in Lebanon and other places. So he's uh, basically himself, Mr. Saman, saying that uh, Saudi Arabia gives money to uh, Lebanon in exchange for certain things. Now I have uh, what I uh, want to argue against is that he, uh, the Saudi Arabia gives uh, money to a specific 
group of people, a specific party, a specific uh, camp in Lebanon that serves its interests. Which is called We the saw government. it in the last elections, and uh, that takes us back <laughs> uh, to this uh, whole, uh, the whole reason behind this visit. Is uh, in the last elections uh, there were uh, uh, an estimated two billion dollars spent by the March 14th camp in the parliamentary elections, uh, basically to buy the elections. And uh, there is no way that Saad al Hariri can have the same parliamentary bloc that he had in 2005 without spending some money uh, in the upcoming elections. And this is the gist of what happened right now in Saudi Arabia. They are trying to, uh, the, uh, the Saudis know that their allies are fragmented and partly because of uh, their own fault, because they created this mess. They attempted uh, an internal future movement coup against Saad al-Hariri. And uh, now we have this fragmentation, the future movement. And on top of that, uh, the future movement itself has weakened because of its practices, uh, Saad al-Hariri owes a lot of money to a lot of his employees that he hasn't paid over the years. Uh, his uh, businesses aren't doing great. Saudi OJ uh, has uh, t uh, thousands of uh, employees that uh, didn't get paid, and he has uh, legal issues in Saudi Arabia right. because of that. He has legal issues uh, in uh, Turkey also, where he lost uh, controlling um, uh, controlling uh, part of uh, uh, Turk Telecom. Uh, his company owned there, uh, also because of uh, fi uh, the bad financial situation that he's facing. So he's uh, in, a, a, in a basically in dire need for a cash influx. And I think, I mean, we have to wait and see what happened in this brief meeting that he held with Mohammed bin, Sal uh, bin Salman um, uh, after midnight on uh, Friday. But uh, uh, we have to wait and see what happened. But it's all about money for the elections okay. in order to be able to compete against his uh, opposition. Halim, is it all about money? Before the elections, absolutely. But I'll just add to what Jamal said, is that, yes, of course, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, there is a big question in terms of who it's going to support during the upcoming elections. And it is true that in 2009 that there was a record uh, amount of spending. But we can't only uh, just say that it's Saudi Arabia that is spending money in uh, in Lebanon, obviously, also Iran is uh, spending money with arming Hezbollah and uh, giving aid to uh, the Hezbollah parties. The uh, supporters of Saudi Arabia claim that uh, Saudi Arabia, the difference is, is that Saudi Arabia supports uh, the state uh, because it supports, you know, the prime minister, it supports the uh, government institutions. But uh, beyond the money, I think, uh, the, the, the really the, uh, the important question and the big question, I think, going forward is going to be uh, based on the results of the elections because it is a new electoral law the first time Lebanon is voting in nine years. It's a very unpredictable election. So, yes, of course, money is the issue, but I think uh, beyond it, it's the results of the uh, parliamentary elections, getting a feeling for what the Lebanese public actually think about those uh, right. these issues. So we've been hearing for nine years now about uh, what uh, what Saudi Arabia thinks about Hezbollah, what others think about Iran, what they think about Saudi Arabia. Th We're yeah, going to get really a chance important. to see exactly Certainly. where the Lebanese people stand. Yeah, we need to, and we need to hear what the Lebanese people say. Uh, yeah. and, and, and I want to give some Salman, 20 seconds to finish off here with the final word. Salman, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I think uh, when it comes to Saudi-Lebanese relations, as I said, Saudi Arabia does not have any intention to either control Lebanon or to, to, to do harm to Lebanon. Saudi Arabia, and for the record and for the historical record, record Saudi Arabia has been providing and giving to Lebanon more than it has been taking. This is number one. And when it comes to the Iranian support, and if we compare it to it, if we go to the Washington Institute report, that they, they said it clearly that more than $800 million have been paid by Saudi Arabia for the rebuilding of, of, of Lebanon, where 25, 25 million dollars has been uh, sent by the Iranians. So okay. there's no comparison. We should not put it in, in such a way that Saudi Arabia is trying to, to control. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, as we all know, it's the, it's the country that has the two holy mosques and it has Someone this kind of responsibility, you. the moral, res okay, moral responsibility to Fair protect enough. the Arab nations okay. from the Iranian regime. Okay, you made your point firmly. Salman, Halim and Jamal. I really have to move on, but I thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. If it is proven that the death of the investigative reporter was connected with his journalistic work, it would be an unprecedented attack on freedom of speech and democracy in Slovakia.
It's a murder that's shaken a nation. Investigative journalist Jan Kutsiak and his fiance were gunned down at their home in Slovakia last week. Having dug deep into the underground world of political corruption, Kutsiak could have had powerful enemies. He was killed before finishing an investigative report that linked some Slovakian politicians with Italian organized crime. But the killing didn't silence his work. Several Slovak newspapers printed his final article after his death. Outrage over his murder has brought thousands of protesters into the streets. And Prime Minister Robert Fitzo has offered a $1.2 million reward for information about the killings. He's also downplayed media reports that a probe into the slaying centered on one of his closest advisors. So is it now dangerous to be a journalist in Slovakia? And will Kutsiak's murder spark political change? Well, joining me to discuss this and more is one of the slain reporter's colleagues from Br Bratislava, Martin Turček. He's an investigative reporter at Actuality.sk, and he worked on the same team as Kutsiak. First of all, Martin, my condolences. I'm very sorry that you lost a colleague um, and a friend, I'd imagine, and his fiancé as well. Who do you think killed Jan and Martina? We cannot be sure at this moment who killed them, but we have our suspicions, and we're confident that it was connected to his investigative work. Tell me to what extent he had rubbed up powerful people the wrong way with his work. Well, he reported on various cases connected to corruption, tax fraud, uh, grants given for projects that didn't make any sense, and his last report was on connection between uh, guys connected to Ndrangheta to the office of the government here in Slovakia. Right, and now we know the president has been outspoken, calling for a government shakeup, maybe even new elections. The prime minister was angry at that, and the prime minister said, Mr. Fitzo, that the president is dancing on the graves of the victims by trying to politicize this. Is the prime minister wrong? Well, I think he also said that journalists are dancing on Jan's grave, and I think he's uh, mistaken and that nobody is dancing on Jan's grave. We're all very, very mm -hmm. deeply hurt by what happened. Of course. And if I could ask you on, on a personal level, do you fear for your own safety given that you do the same work? Not right now, but we uh, have to partake in some security precautions, but I, I have no fear. When you see thousands of people take to the streets and use this as a a launching pad to talk about broader corruption and the fact that they believe criminals are deeply invested in the state. Do you think there's an, I guess, I'm not sure how to, how to ask this, but do you feel that Jan would be proud of the fact that people have felt that his death would not be for nothing? Yes, I, I think so. I think Jan would be very glad that uh, tens of thousands of people came to honor his memory in March last Friday, and I also think that Jan wanted people to be uh, more aware of, of uh, how corruption yeah. spreads in Slovakia and, and think about it and think about how they, how they might want to change that. Yeah, uh, and Martin, given the, the work that you do, to the outside world, explain to us, in your opinion, based on the work, to what extent have criminals got their hands on the levers of power in your country? Uh, well, it seems that criminal elements are, are connected to many politicians in Slovakia. It's, uh, we, uh, we've investigated numerous cases of political corruption and we've almost gotten used to it, but f uncovering uh, political corruption that is close to guys that have ties with mafia, that's, that's still a, a new thing here. Mm -hmm. And all of those arrested recently were released within 48 hours. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, I, since we don't have detailed information about the investigation, why uh, they were arrested or why they were released, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to comment on that. But I, I, I have trust that police wants to investigate this thoroughly and, and independently. Do you believe that this is the beginning of major change in your country? I hope so. Hmm. If you had a message... Uh, it it you, might be. It yeah. certainly seems that it might be. Yeah. If you had a message for the Prime Minister, who's saying, uh, guys, just leave it... The Prime Minister is saying, guys, uh, just leave it to the courts or leave it to the police, leave it to the investigation. 
as you said, you know, don't dance on the graves of the victims. Um, there are those who are saying, well, the prime minister should be investigated himself, right? If you had a message for him, what would that be? I wouldn't really like to give any messages to prime minister because this is this is thing of a political concern, and for us as journalists, the the biggest concern is to to report on what's the truth and f find that out and report on it, and not to really mm, affect politics in this way as, as sending messages to uh, okay. to the prime minister okay. or the minister. Okay, of and, and that's fair enough, and I and I think that's you know that's uh, commendable. Uh, if Martin, if I could ask you, those who killed Jan and Martina, whoever they might have been, felt they are going to silence journalists and they're going to stop journalists from digging into dodgy finances or digging, in, digging into dodgy politicians. Is that going to work in Slovakia? Are journalists going to be more afraid to uncover anything wrong? No. Tell me That's why you're, why you're so confident. That's definitely not going to work and I think that whoever is responsible... I think whoever's responsible for Jan's murder already knows that it was the biggest mistake of his life that he cannot silence Jan, he cannot, cannot silence the rest of his uh, fellow journalist colleagues. And we are already forming a Slovakia-wide investigative team and also Europe-wide investigative team here in Actuality SK to work further on Jan's topics and to make them heard to, to the whole world. So I, I think nobody can, can in the future hope to silence anybody uh, by, by any of these horrific actions. Martin Churchek, I really thank you for joining us here on The Newsmakers. It's been a pleasure talking to you. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Next time, the UN says it knows who's committed war crimes in South Sudan. But will the accused perpetrators ever come before a court? Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.